Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And, uh, Jim, we begin with more good economic news. We've done this quite a bit in the last few weeks and months, and we're not getting tired of it. Uh, The president said we might, but we're not, at least not yet. Uh, CNBC employment costs rose more than expected in the third quarter and a sign that more inflation could be brewing in the U.S. economy. That's not the good news. The Labor Department's employment cost index rose 0.8 percent for the period, ahead of the estimate of 0.7 from economists. Wages and salaries rose 0.9 percent, well ahead of the expectations for 0.5 percent. On a yearly basis, wages and salaries jumped 3.1 percent, the biggest increase in 10 years. Wages and increases have been the missing link in the economy since the recovery began in mid-2008. I think that uh, fact is wrong. <laughs> That's when the crisis happened. Uh, average hourly earnings have been rising steadily but have stayed below the 3 percent level as slack has remained in the labor market. However, the unemployment rate is now at 3.7 percent, the lowest since 1969, and wage pressures have begun to build. And oh, by the way, the wage data came the same day that ADP and Moody's reported private payroll growth of 227,000 in October, easily beating Wall Street expectations. So, uh, Jim, we'd love to see it even quite a bit higher than 3.1%. Everybody likes more take-home pay, but at least it's headed in the right direction, and it's headed in the right direction and at the greatest level in a decade. Yeah, and Greg, there's two other thoughts kind of worth jumping out here, two new sets of economic numbers uh, in addition, obviously, we've seen the unemployment rate get lower and lower, and, and the number of uh, job openings is now, I believe, in the neighborhood of 7 million. Uh, there are only apparently 6 million unemployed Americans out there. Uh, consumer confidence is an 18-year high. Um, there's also new numbers indicating that annual home price gains are below 6% for the first time in a year in August. Uh, I mean, there's a little bit of a slowdown there. But by and large, these are really good economic numbers. And so if you, you know, when we are one week from Election Day, if you're a Republican, if you're an incumbent, this is what you want. This is what you want to see. There's a little bit of a bad aftertaste to this uh, uh, good martini. And it's that if you're a Republican incumbent, it may or may not be helping you that much. I think it's safe to say Scott Walker is not out of the woods yet. And employment in, the, in his state, which had been hit really hard during the Great Recession, is now down in the neighborhood of 3%. It, it's an interesting fact, the idea, we, we remember thinking back to 1992 and Bill Clinton and the unofficial slogan, it's the economy, stupid. Then various other people started arguing about other issues being it's the this stupid, it's that stupid. Greg, I don't know about you, I always came around to the idea that it's the calling people stupid, stupid. Um, <laughs> the people just got tired of that. Uh, but here's you know, the idea of whether the economy has a bigger impact on voters and puts them in more of an anti-incumbent mood When the economy is bad, you get more blame for the bad times than you get credit for the good times. Still, in a political environment that's been very, very tough for Republicans uh, for much of the last year, they can at least, you know, reassure themselves that the economy is doing about as well as they can. uh, And that the people who say they're voting for Democrats because the economy is doing badly basically are committed partisans. Their partisanship is driving their perception of the economy not that the state of the economy is driving their partisanship. We'll see if the economy uh, is a decisive issue. It probably is more so during a presidential campaign season. But uh, if the president and Republicans were smart, they'd be hammering this issue a lot more than they have been. Uh, We'll see what they do over the last week of this campaign. Let's move to the bad martini and on to other aspects of the midterm elections now. And Jim, I think a fair reading of the polls would suggest that Republicans are likely to maintain the majority in the Senate. The polls would suggest that Republicans have quite a bit of an uphill climb to maintain control of the House. And then there's the governorships. The governorships could end up looking like Custer at Little Bighorn here for the Republicans. And in case you're not familiar with that event in history, that's not good. Twelve of the 13 most populous states in the country come January could have Democratic governors. Most of them clearly will. Uh, Let's just go down the list. California, clearly Gavin Newsom's going to win there. Texas, that's the lone bright spot. That's where uh, Greg Abbott is likely to win and win big. Then comes Florida, where right now Andrew Gillum has a consistent but small lead over Ron DeSantis. DeSantis could win that race. New York, obviously the Democrats will keep that. Pennsylvania, the same thing. In Illinois, Bruce Rauner, the Republican governor, is likely to get slaughtered. So that'll turn over to the Democrats. Ohio is very much a competitive race, but uh, right now Richard Cordray seems to have a lead over Mike DeWine. 
In Georgia, it's a dead heat between Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams. North Carolina is not up this year. They have a Democratic governor. In Michigan, it's likely to be Gretchen Whitmer, a Democrat, replacing the Republican Rick Snyder. New Jersey has a Democratic governor. Virginia has a Democratic governor. And Washington has a Democratic governor, all of whom are not up for re-election this year. The 14th most populous state is Arizona, and the Republicans are expected to do fine there. So, uh, Jim, that's a lot of people in those 13 states. You can easily win the Electoral College uh, by winning just a fraction of those. Uh, and, and we're pretty close right now to the Democrats having a stranglehold on virtually all of them. Yeah, and I think it's kind of, this is where we might have the argument about whether Trumpism has really been an overall net positive for the Republican Party. Trump's going to various states and uh, uh, particularly focused on the Senate uh, races. This is where, you know, approval of his judicial nominations for the next two years will be decided. You know, the governor's races tend to operate on a kind of a different wavelength than the presidential races. And that's, you know, you saw Republicans making fantastic gains in 2010 and in 2014. And you started seeing Republicans winning in places they hadn't won in a while, like places like New Jersey, uh, Virginia with Bob McDonnell. And you know, we still remember how well that turned out. <laughs> um, you know, but the idea of you know, Nevada, Brian Sandoval, and maybe one of the factors that's causing the tough outlook for Republicans this year are governors that are term limited. Um, Rick Scott can't run again. He's running for the Senate. Terry Branstad left uh, to go off to be ambassador, and there's a his Republican lieutenant governor stepped up. I think I was in that that toss up category. Whatever else you think of John Kasich, and everyone remembers what big fans we are here at this podcast of John <laughs> Kasich. The guy went out and won Ohio by wide margins. Um, now look, there's going to be some nice wins for Republicans this year. Larry Hogan, it looks like he's going to you know just stomp Ben Jealous in the governor's race out there in, in Maryland. Uh, Charlie Baker, to the extent he's a Republican, and some people point out he's not that Republican, uh, but he's expected to win by a wide margin in uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, Republicans should keep the Tennessee governor's mansion pretty handily. Uh, Republicans should keep the South Carolina governor's mansion pretty handily. And let's face it, you shouldn't really be worrying about South Carolina. By and large, where they've had to, you know, nom- where it's been an open seat race, like Florida and Georgia, you probably put Iowa in there, Ohio. Nevada, it, it has, you know, there's some talk Republicans might pick up in Oregon, but I've, I've put that in the category of I'll believe it when I see it, that the new guys, they're just not as good as the ones who were rising up in 2010 and 2014. Now, having said, the other problem is that where you lose in the governor's race, you tend to do not so well in the state legislative races, Virginia being exhibit A. Uh, and let's say, you know, as we head into 2020, all of a sudden, this is where you start redrawing the lines after the next census. And this is where you'd like to have nice big... Uh, uh, majorities in your state legislatures as the decade comes to a close. So Republicans could be putting themselves in a real problem here. And I don't know if the Trump image that works so well in a place like Tennessee certainly seems to still be doing fine in a place like Texas. Uh, maybe it doesn't serve you quite so well in that upper Midwest. Uh, I, I, Trump won states like Ohio and Michigan, Wisconsin and uh, Iowa and came a little closer in Minnesota than everybody expected. But so far, it's not looking great for Republicans in those states. And I think that the party might have to reevaluate itself. And it's, it's, it's been very intriguing how Trump managed to win a bunch of those states that we, people thought of being blue. Here we are two years later. Uh, and, you know, Wisconsin isn't looking so secure anymore. Michigan, I think it's safe to say Republicans are going to get wiped out. Apparently, the early voting numbers in Iowa are looking really bad for the GOP. The good news for Republicans is there's no Senate uh, race in, in Iowa this year, but you have a bad year, you lose your governorship, your lieutenant governorship, your state attorney general, which is generally a stepping stone to other statewide offices, secretary of state, treasurer. Uh, I think there's like three appellate court judges, state court judges on there. A bad midterm cycle can last you up for a good long while, particularly if it's close to the end of the decade. So uh, time for Republicans to kind of sound the alarm and you know look hard at why are they not doing as well in these states as they used to discouraging to say the least obviously we're not going to throw our hands up too much until we see what the final results are but if the polls are anywhere close uh that's going to be the big black eye for the republicans uh this year uh they're in position to really get smacked around so that's a real bad martini but we haven't even gotten to the crazy one yet all right so the outlook on the governor's side is really bad but do not despair we need some encouragement some stability and uh, nobody brings stability to the three martini lunch or politics in general more than Kanye West. So <laughs> let's let's talk about Kanye here. In our crazy martini, Jim, nobody could have seen this coming. No one except for just about everyone. Kanye West, you know, a few months ago was uh, tweeting out his MAGA hat and how he and Donald Trump had dragon energy. And just a few weeks ago, he was in the Oval Office with 
Jim Brown and uh, talking about how we love this guy and uh, no one's going to put him in a box and his words are like fine wine. Well, all of a sudden, Kanye West wants nothing to do with politics anymore. Went on a little bit of a tweet storm yesterday. We'll see how much of this makes sense. In chronological order, I support creating jobs and opportunities for people who need them the most. I support prison reform. I support common sense gun laws that will make our world safer. I support those who risk their lives to serve and protect us. And I support holding people who misuse their power accountable. I believe in love and compassion for people seeking asylum and parents who are fighting to protect their children from violence and war. I would like to thank my family, loved ones, and community for supporting my actual beliefs and my vision for a better world. I introduce Candace, meaning Candace Owens of Turning Point USA, to the person who made the logo for the Blexit movement, meaning Black Exit from the Democratic Party, and they didn't want their name on it, so she used mine. I never wanted any association with Blexit. I have nothing to do with it. My eyes are wide open now, and I realize I've been used to spread messages I don't believe in. I am distancing myself from politics and completely focusing on being creative. Now, Jim, some people have pointed out that the sales of the latest line of Yeezy shoes are way down. And maybe that's because Kanye thinks he's alienated some people politically, whether that's the case or whether Kanye is just not all that stable or whether he's changed his mind yet again. Who knows? But it's a good lesson to Republicans that uh, you might want to be careful who you hit your wagon to. What do you think? Greg, we've seen Brexit. We've seen the claims of Blexit. And now we have Yexit. <laughs> Kanye exit, to be clear. Um, you know, look, we really enjoy making fun of Democrats when they embrace celebrity, you know, Hollywood or some pop star. And then the Hollywood pop star gets a question and they say something like, you know, if we just greeted the refugees at the border with hugs, there would never be any more drug trade or people smuggling. These utterly inane, disconnected from reality, happy talk, unrealistic wildly naive, you know, assessments of the world that probably come more naturally to you when you are a multimillionaire and everyone around you is always sucking up to you and telling you how great your ideas are. Uh, as I write about in today's Morning Jolt, I'm not sure that Hollywood and, and, you know, pop music and hip hop and all those folks, I'm not sure they really are the huge advantage for the Democratic Party that some folks on the right think they are. In fact, I think you might even argue they're a little bit of a liability. Clearly, there's a certain fan base of various movies, TV shows, music stars, et cetera, who kind of wish they would shut up about politics, even if you necessarily agree with them. Like, I really love Adam Baldwin on Firefly. I've enjoyed most of his work. Uh, if Adam Baldwin, like, suddenly were to flip and become a liberal tomorrow, which I don't think is going to happen. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if he did, like, would I, would I stop liking Firefly anymore? No. Like, most people separate that because we don't look to actors and musicians for political guidance and for, you know, policy solutions and things like that. Maybe they have a philosophy and outlook on life or something that's admirable. But all in all, here we are now, entertain us, as uh, Kurt Cobain once said. <laughs> I don't think conservatives should be tearing their hair out about Hollywood and, and pop stars being liberal. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the entertainment industry has to be 50-50 or has to represent us. And I think everything in Hollywood is, it, it's an environment designed to cultivate liberal progressivism. Part of that's because, one, there's a lot of money. They're wealthy. They're not going to be, a bunch of these stars are not going to be complaining about income taxes. They have people managing their money. They have people managing all the little details of life that you and I, you know, that everybody else has to worry about. Somebody else is doing their taxes. Somebody else is managing their mortgages on their multiple homes and stuff like that. Obviously, they all think of themselves as being creative bohemians who are rebelling against the staid and, you know, hidebound, calcified uh, old establishment. Never mind, Greg, that the, you know, the old establishment in Hollywood died off in like what? The 50s, 60s? <laughs> you know, certainly, uh, certainly after, after Reagan, it certainly saw this uh, shift towards the left. Obviously, there's groupthink. Obviously, there's fears of career consequences. Nobody wants to be too outspoken against the Barbara Streisands of the world and everyone else who's an outspoken uh, lefty. Uh, people fear career repercussions. That's understandable. And it's basically an environment in which uh, I strongly suspect that things that strike conservatives as parts of the liberal agenda, global warming and environmentalism, uh, gay rights, abortion rights. I don't think these are even seen as being political in Hollywood circles. My suspicion is um, that this is actually uh, just common sense to them. They're just good causes. They're not even seen as being partisan. Uh, when, of course, in fact, the, the viewpoints in the rest of America are probably very different from those from within Hollywood. Um, and then finally, kind of the last thing, I, I periodically wonder, I mean, we, we all heard it when the uh, Harvey Weinstein stories came out. 
these ludicrous stories about, uh, you know, actresses like Mira Sorvino suddenly just having their, I believe Annabella Sciorra, having their careers just ruined by Weinstein because they would not give in to his advances. Like if you wonder, gee, I wonder why I never saw that actress anymore. Well, maybe it's because Weinstein put her on a blacklist and it was strictly enforced. This is a, a culture in which, you know, there really is rampant abuse going on. And so my suspicion is that if you're thriving, if you're making good money, if you're making, you know, if you're living out your wildest dreams in an industry that on some level you sense and you know, and you've heard the rumors that this place is deeply corrupt, that this place is not just Bacchanalian in its excess, but really almost the marquee de sad, abusive and exploitational of, of other people. No doubt you feel some guilt. First of all, then you probably believe that every other industry is the same way. And that obviously, you know, well, well clearly if Hollywood is so corrupt, then clearly uh, the energy industry has to be that corrupt. Publishing has to be that corrupt. Journalism has to be that corrupt. The oil industry, uh, real estate, you, every industry must be as corrupt as Hollywood. It's my suspicion that many Hollywood stars see it that way. And then the second thing is that, so you do buy into this uh, liberal worldview of big, evil, rich, powerful corporations that are out exploiting people. And you want to be one of the good rich people. So you give a lot to lefty causes and, you know, show up for the Planned Parenthood dinner and, you know, have your picture taken with Hillary Clinton and every other Democrat that comes to town. That's your way of dealing with the guilt of realizing you're in a town and you're in, a, in an industry that has a rottenness at its core that it's constantly trying to obscure from the people that make up its audience. So that's why it is, Greg. And that's why you shouldn't follow Kanye. Jim, you had more coherent thoughts in that particular response (laughs) than Kanye West has had in however many years he's been in the public eye. It's probably getting close to 20 now, I would hazard to say, maybe 15. But uh, well done. Well done. And we'll see uh, when Kanye lurches back towards the middle or to the right again, depending on how shoe sales or just uh, just the whims of his mind go. So, yeah, look, it's an old saying, Greg, East is East and West is whatever he feels like being today. (laughs) fascinating. Jim, have a good one. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Have a great day, everyone.